Hello and welcome to the Flix Forum podcast where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original film in the order of release. This episode we have Netflix 263rd film from 2020. It's the science fiction action film Project Power directed by Henry Joost and Ariel Schulman. It stars Jamie Foxx, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Dominic Fishback, Rodrigo Santoro, Colson Baker, Alan Maldonado, Amy Landecker, and Courtney B. Vance. I'm Jesse. I'm here solo for this big Netflix film, which I'm looking forward to talking about. Remember when it came out? Didn't have any context around it, so I'm excited to get into that today. But as always, we do start the show with the fast flicks. We're going to give a quick little summary about the film. Obviously, if uh, you don't want to know anything about the film and want to avoid spoilers, then give us a pause and come back a little bit later on, because the fast look for this one, uh, I struggled with it, but I've said it's about a dealer, a cop, and an ex-military servant who team up to stop bad guys from distributing pills that give powers and allow bad guys to rule the world. <laughs> Horrible. I'm sorry about that, but that's like, I mean, I really struggled. I wrote about four different iterations and um, yeah, that, that's the best I could come up with. So this one's got a good story. Uh, we've got lots to talk about, about how it actually ended up on Netflix. So let, let's get into it because I think, uh, you know, the, there's sort of, um, you know, a, a good story behind it. And we go back to 2016 when first time screenwriter Matson Tomlin um, he, he came up with this idea for this film in a coffee shop uh, when he was just 25 years old. So we head to October of 2017 when it was announced that Netflix had acquired this uh, spec script. Uh, it was titled Power at the time, and there was a bidding war with a few other studios. Um, Ariel Shulman and Henry Joost uh, came on board to direct the film. And then we go to September of 2018 when Jamie Foxx, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and Dominic Fishback joined the cast. Um, then we go to July of 2020 where it was announced that the film would officially be titled Project Power. Um, and then we skip back a bit because principal photography, it started in October of 2018, went through to near the end of December of 2018, um, and filmed in and around New Orleans, or New Orleans, um, on set on the 31st of October of 2018. Um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was actually injured while riding a bicycle on set, so a little bit of an inside there. Project Power, it was released on Netflix on the 14th of August of 2020, and it was the top streamed film on the platform in its first two weekends before finishing in second place in its third weekend. In October of 2020, Netflix reported that 75 million households had watched the film over its first four weeks of release. So Netflix would be pretty happy with those numbers, I would suggest. If we head into November of 2020, Variety reported that the film was the 12th most watched straight to streaming title of 2020 up to that point. So again, some pretty good figures there for Netflix. Machine Gun Kelly is in this film. He's under his real name of Colson Barker. He plays his character Newt. Um, Dominic Fishback plays this character Robin, um, a high school kid. Um, but Dominic was actually, Dominique was actually 29 years old and a university graduate when the movie was released. So Dominique, um, you know, comes across as quite young in this one. When uh, Frank, character in this film, says, you know what happened the last time we trusted New Orleans guys in suits? And this is referenced directly to Hurricane Katrina and the US government's poor job in helping the city. So we'll talk a little bit about that in themes as well, I guess. Um, director Errol Schumann said, it's a movie with no superheroes, which is interesting because him and um, Juiced said there were many more superpowers that they had that didn't make the final cut. Um, there's this version of the movie that they said that had twice as many powers, um, that this massive list of powers and the corresponding animals that the powers linked up to as well. So that's an interesting little thing to think about. They also mentioned that they the reason they sort of scaled this back, I guess, was to allow more room for the dramatic scenes. and. For them, that was the heart of the movie, the relationship between Robin and Art, who we'll talk about when we get to some characters very soon. The screenwriter, Matson Tomlin, he said he hoped for a sequel um, because he originally pitched the film to Netflix as a way to Rubik's Cube so many different genres. So, um, you know, uh, talking about you could do a film as a horror, you could do it as a sci-fi, a coming-of-age movie. They can keep mixing and matching the, the different genres in exciting ways. So, uh, positivity from the people um, who created this film. When the film came out, and this is a hard one to sort of explain, but it was just the second film to spend 10 consecutive days at the top of the daily top 10 list of Netflix films. The only other film that had done that so far prior to this was Spencer Confidential, which we've covered on this show as well. So if we look through that list um, of the consecutive days at the top of the top 10 list, Spencer Confidential holds the record with 18 days, and then Project Power is second with 10. 
Third, we've got the wrong Missy. We've covered that on this show for nine days, the same as the Kissing Booth 2, which also spent nine days. I've got an episode of that as well. The next one, um, not necessarily Netflix originals around the world, but um, we had the Angry Birds 2 movie that spent eight days, Uncut Gems. I know it was a Netflix original in some territories. That spent eight days. Another film we've done recently, Fatal Affair. That actually spent seven days on this list. Uh, crazy. Uh, number eight was 365 Days, spent seven days. The Old Guard, another film we've also done recently, uh, spent six days, as well as Extraction um, and Despicable Me, all spending six days on that list as well. So quite interesting there. If we look at the translations around the world in Chinese, this is called Superplan. In Hungarian, it's called My Zoe. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Um, <laughs> very, very weird sort of title. Um, another title in Hungarian was The Power of Dust. And in Ukraine, it's called Project Strength. As I mentioned before, the working title for this one was Power. The tagline, I hate the tagline for this one. The tagline is, what would you risk for five minutes of pure power? Question mark. Uh, really horrible ta <laughs> tagline, I think, because obviously you take one of these pills and you get five minutes of superpower that you don't get to choose. You just get whatever you're given. So, um, yeah, interesting. All right. What are the critics? And oh, before we talk about the critics, I did mention that uh, this hit Netflix on the 14th of August, 2020. Cost about $85 million to make, so not necessarily one of the cheapest Netflix films. Uh, filmed in and around New Orleans. It won one out of three awards at the Visual Effects Society Awards. Had four nominations at the People's Choice Awards for Favourite Action Movie, Favourite Motion Picture, Favourite Action Star for Jamie Foxx, and also Favourite Male Star for Jamie Foxx. And was also nominated at the Taurus World Stunt Awards and also the Image Awards. So had a couple of nominations. But what are the critics and audiences saying? Rotten Tomatoes sits at 61%. That is fresh on 186 reviews. So quite a lot of critic reviews there. Audience a bit lower at 46%. That's on more than 1,000 ratings. So still a lot of people getting on there to log it. IMDb has 95,000 ratings. Sits at a 6 out of 10. So very similar to what the critics are saying on Rotten Tomatoes. Letterbox a little bit lower. Sits at a 2.5 out of 5. That's on nearly 70,000 ratings. But it's actually been logged by 97,000 people. Metacritic. Sits at a 51 on 35 critic reviews. That's in the middle section, the yellow section. And the audience, it's also in the yellow section. It sits at a 5.1 out of 10 on 159 reviews. So a lot of people have seen this film. What are my thoughts? I think it's a really cool and interesting idea. Um, and it's enjoyable at times, but also made me think throughout how much better this probably could have been. So a little bit of a whack on the way out there. But let, let's get into the film. Let's talk about the characters. So realistically, Robin is our main character, our main protagonist. She's an excellent rapper, but with her age, she's not giving her all to school because her mother's sick, so she's sort of hustling. She needs money for meds. Even, um, you know, the the trade in these meds is illegal. Um, this, this power that they're talking about. So she's got this working relationship with this cop, Frank, um, ends up working with this other guy called Art, played by Jamie Foxx, we'll talk about soon. Um, and she almost sees the reflection of a father that she doesn't have in art, I guess, because he's the one who cares about his daughter and, and you know, he probably sees the same in her as well. And, and that probably, you know, art will talk about him is this vigilante, I guess, who has that personal connection of his daughter who's been taken from him, being experimented on. So he'll go at all lengths to find her and save her, I guess. I talk about Frank. Frank's that cop. He sort of blurs the line between being a good and a bad cop. Sort of he, he's happy to try the product himself. Um, even though that's the, the drug that's destroying the city that he loves. And, um, you know, he's also happy to sort of go about his job in unconventional ways. Uh, and, and, you know, it's super clear that we know how much he loves uh, New Orleans and the city he lives in with the amount of NFL gear and sports gear that he wears as he's going around. Um, I mentioned Newt earlier on. Um, he's sort of like this middle range drug dealer. Um, it's sort of like the version of the bad. So the audience can actually see the bad impacts that this drug can have or the addiction of this drug can have on people. Um, interesting. All right. Henry Joost and Errol Schumann, the directors. <laughs> I've watched Catfish. So Catfish is a MTV television show that many of you would probably have, have seen or heard of before where they, they go or they, they check in with some people who've met someone online, haven't met them in real life yet and work out if they, they're real people and can actually meet. So this is actually based on a documentary that these two uh, created, which I've, I've taught many times and I think it's an excellent documentary to check out, but it's based on that. So that's an interesting little fact. They've also directed Paranormal Activity 3 and 4 and these, these visual films that you probably would recognize like Nerve, um, Viral and Secret Headquarters. So they've got a very distinct visual style that they like to work in. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm sort of interested to see what else they do. But before we 
venture into any of their other films. Let's talk about scenes from this one that stood out. So I think, uh, Robin, I mentioned before that she wants, like, you know, the positive in her life could be that she could be a rapper. And I thought the, her rapping throughout the film was pretty good. Um, but some of the lyrics are a little bit iffy, I think. As much as I love Dwight Howard as a basketballer, um, lyrics about him sort of felt a bit forced. Uh, I like their rap to the teacher to sort of, you know, um, get back at him. But, like, why not make that real? Like, show that she's a rebel at school because it, it turned out that it was a, a dream and I just thought that was a bit lame. Um, I like the banter between Frank and Robin about him being like Clint Eastwood, especially when we get that line towards the end from Dirty Harry, like, you know, what's it going to be, punk? I thought that was cool. Frank uh, chases this camouflage this guy who's got camouflage powers um, through the city and through buildings. I thought that was pretty cool. The connecting moments between Art losing his kid and Robin reminding him of her, I thought they were excellent as well. Uh, the whole um, sort of, there's a scene in this club, I guess it is at the end, sort of all the buyers of this drug are all together to see a demonstration of it. And there's this chick who's in a tank to show off her powers and everything sort of goes wrong and it gets icy cold. Like, um, you know, they make a joke in relation to Frozen, the film as well. And she's like trapped in there and, and it's almost dying, yelling to get out. And the camera stays in there with her the whole time while the violence occurs outside. It was such a more effective way of doing violence. And a lot of the violence we saw in the rest of the film, I thought that was really well done. Things that I didn't necessarily like, I think um, Newt, this character, we saw his sort of uh, ability was to sort of get on or catch fire. Um, and then he sort of goes nuts uh, on art towards the start and art sort of tricks him um, sort of puts him out and then um, you know he explodes I, th I just thought that was a little bit over the top I think uh, Robin uh, sort of stitches art back together after he's being sort of shot I just thought that was a little bit weird a little bit out there that you know this high school kid knows or has a vet that she can go to and get the resources to stitch him together and I think the final explosion so we know art doesn't want to use his powers and um, you know he's really putting off using it, and then he takes his pill, and he just, it almost just wipes everything out. It sort of feels like a reset option at the end of the film to just you know restart. I thought about it was a little bit of a pointless end to the film, so that was a little bit frustrating. Um, what's this film saying? What are some themes? What are some ideas? I think you know the idea of buried human strength, um, through, like you know that can come out if you take this pill, um, and, and you see experimentation and and how do we reach humanity's full potential? Um, but possibly in other ways, you know, you can find your power or your strength through things like rapping, um, in the case of Robin, or um, beating corruption that, that we want to see Frank do as well, or, or the idea of family that Art chases as well. And obviously the, the title is power, so that, that idea of reclaiming power and control. Obviously New Orleans is picked as, as a location purposely after Hurricane Katrina and the obstacles that African Americans and black people face. You know, Robin, she's a young black woman. The, the system, it's, you know, we hear it very blatantly in the dialogue, it's designed to swallow her. Um, you know, family can't access healthcare. Um, Art went to the army, um, you know, needing to work the system harder than it works him. And it's almost that idea of leveling the play, playing field as well through the, this drug or this idea. And also that idea to sort of, you know, dodgy politicians and the, de the decisions they're making that are impacting the everyday people in life too. Uh, all right, what do I take away from this one? The special effects um, at certain times really sort of struggled from being on a smaller screen, I think. I think, you know, in a cinema, they would have stood out a lot more and wouldn't have, wouldn't have looked as so cheap. So that, that's my one takeaway from this film. We do often work out, you know, if there's someone we've seen on screen, do we recognize them? So we jump on IMDb to check them out and see what, you know, what other work they've done. For me, I looked up Dominique um, Fishback, who plays Robin. We've spoken about Robin. I just wanted to see if she's a rapper in real life because she raps a bit in this film. But uh, no, not that I could see. So interesting little take there. All right, questions, ponderings. What are some things that I thought about while watching this film? I think uh, the military, you know, we, we see that art, gets his powers because the military played around with his genes so I, I just wanted to see you know obviously everyone else is taking these pills and, and getting their powers based on just the pill so I mean it seems like he's passed these genetic powers to his daughter I would have liked more of a background I guess as to to what the military were trying to do were they they're just simply trying to create a weapon of mass destruction that Im that implodes is that what it was trying to be I don't know I, I felt like that was a little bit unanswered I guess what would the power structure of society do with this ability to sort of form instant superheroes or villains and, and what would it do to communities of people who have power stripped from them over generations, you know? that, And obviously that, that sort of ties into to the idea of New Orleans being a location, um, you know, a lot of disenfranchised people. So I thought that was interesting too. Substance abuse is obviously used in this to, to and you know, the, the people they're chasing aren't necessarily using the substance for positives, but is it almost glamorizing the idea that 
of, of using something illegal. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure that it actually takes a stance on that. So I thought that's something else to ponder. Uh, I really, this one sort of intrigued me the most, I think, because we didn't get to see Robin use or find any of her own powers. Um, maybe I like that idea. So it means she sort of keeps her innocence as a character. So maybe that, that's a purposeful choice that's really good. But, you know, if there's a sequel, does that innocence completely change and, and that's the development of the character? I'm not sure. Um, and then, you know, the character name of Robin, just like, <laughs> is the, were they just giving her that name so they could include some Batman jokes? I'm not sure that Robin's the best name for her as a character. Um, I'm ready to wrap this up. Thanks for listening so far. Uh, we give the film a rating out of five for an overall flicks forum result. For me, I think, you know, it's enjoyable enough to give it a watch. I think it would be hard to believe that this would have been developed or released without Netflix because it's a bit of an out there sort of sort of idea and story. And so kudos, I guess, for Netflix for, for giving audiences um, to an original film. I think it just would have been nicer if it was executed a little bit better. That's probably what frustrated me at times. I'm still giving it a three out of five. So a three out of five for me, decent score. We got socials. We have Instagram, Facebook, and X, formerly known as Twitter. Question I wanted to put out there to go along with this episode is, would you try the power? Is the power something that you'd want to try? I don't think I'd be game enough, to be honest. I don't think I could uh, deal with the idea of, of losing control for five minutes, even if that, that control was, uh, you know, something that I could do positively. I, I just don't think I could do it. <laughs> Maybe some people are more game than me, but that's it for this show. We're, we're back next week. Next week, we've got another 2020 film. It's the computer animated science fiction comedy called Fearless. It's directed by Corey Edwards and stars the voices of Gabrielle Union, Jada Kiss, Miguel J. Pimentel, Yara Shadidi and Miles Robbins. That's what we've got. If you're interested, give it a watch and come and listen next week. Um, other than that, thanks for keeping me company and I'll speak to you then.